years ago, in his commencement speech here at Yale, President John F. Kennedy began by stating that he had the best of two worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. <laughs> well, right from the beginning, I have to admit openly and honestly that I have not been so fortunate in experiencing the wonders of neither of those two academic worlds. Nonetheless, it is an honor and a privilege to be here today at this prestigious institution of higher learning from where two prominent Latinos were educated, becoming for many a source of inspiration. Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor and former Mexican President Ernesto Cedillo. I am also very pleased to know there is a group of young and talented Dominican students here at Yale who have organized themselves since 2005 in a very creative manner within the Dominican Student Association called Quisqueyales. We have Quisqueya, it is the uh, original name of our country, so they have mixed Quisqueya with Yale, calling themselves Quisqueyales, right? <laughs> Personally, I'm not only delighted to find a Dominican and Latino presence in this very vibrant intellectual environment, but also thrilled to share with you the news that even though a small nation, the Dominican Republic, my country, very recently gained a respected status as a world power in a particular field of interest and great following here in the US. Can you guess what? Baseball. <laughs> Just a couple of weeks ago, the Dominican Republic, thank you, <laughs> all right. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Dominican Republic, which can also be called Baseball Land, <laughs> became the undefeated champion of the World Baseball Classic. And it, and it is with that distinction and sense of national pride that I express my gratitude to Yale's authorities, faculty members, and students for inviting me to address you on the relevance of Latin America and the Caribbean in the 21st century. As you all know, Latin America and the Caribbean represent a region of 33 independent and sovereign states, extending from the Rio Grande, this is Texas and New Mexico, to the southern tip of South America, covering an area two and a half times the size of the US. It accounts for nearly 4% of the Earth's surface and can be divided into several subregions, such as Mesoamerica, which includes Mexico and Central America, the Andeans and Southern Cone countries in South America and the Caribbean islands. At this moment, nearly 600 million people live in the area. In 1900, the population was made up of 60 million people. 50 years later, in 1950, it came up to 150 million people, which at that time equals the population of the United States. Since then, up till now, 60 years later, it has quadrupled and is almost the double of current US population. About one third or 30% of Latin America's population is under 15 years of age. So it is a very young population. Great ethnic and demographic diversity characterizes the region. The people of Latin America represent a mixture of various racial groups, comprised of indigenous people, white Europeans, black Africans, Asians, and Arabs. Mexico, Central America, and the Andean regions in South America have the largest indigenous population, which makes up a larger part of the people living in Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru, and Guatemala. Various languages are spoken, Spanish, Portuguese, French, English, Dutch, and over 30 different indigenous ones, including Quechua and Aymara. Latin America has the largest reserves of arable land in the world. It produces oil, metal, foodstuff. It has an impressive rich biodiversity and astonishing natural environments. The region is home to the Amazon rainforest, the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador, and the Andean glaciers. It accounts for 23% of the world's forests and 31% of its freshwater resources. It also houses approximately 70% of the world's species and almost 20% of its ecoregions. Brazil, 
the world's fifth largest country in area and population, has more environmental capital and more fresh water than any country in the world. The region has a combined GDP of 6.7 trillion US dollars at purchasing power parity. Three of its major economies, Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina, are active members of the exclusive World Economic Elite G20 Group. According to a report on economics and trade by the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, better known in Spanish as CEPAL, in 2012, uh, the region is predicted to grow at 3.1% this last year, which is higher than the 2.2% of world economic growth. More precisely, the ECLAC report states that, and I quote, the region's economic reforms of past decades, its fiscal and macroeconomic prudence, and its sound financial supervision, together with ever closer commercial ties with China and other emerging economies, have allowed it not only to successfully navigate through the worst international crisis of the past 80 years, but also to enter the new decade with a promising outlook for growth and advances in quality of life. And for the first time in its history, the region achieved during the past decade a combination of high growth, macroeconomic stability, poverty reduction, and improvement in income distribution. And with regard to global economic recovery, the region is today firmly part of the solution. It was not part of the original problem." End the quote. For this year, 2013, growth projection will heavily depend on the performance of the global economy. At this moment, the economic situation in the European Union is still gloomy. Recession persists in some of the larger economies in the region, and this will surely have an impact on the South American countries that have Europe as its major trading partner. Likewise, some of the emerging economies, uh, like the BRICS, which uh, includes Brazil, Russia, China, India, and now South Africa, have decelerated their growth. And all of this will also influence on the short-term Latin American and Caribbean's economic performance. U.S. economy, regardless of being in a better shape than the European Union, is still fragile and has not fully recovered from the global economic meltdown. This has provoked a decrease of U.S. trade and investments in the region. Imports have dropped from 51% in 2000 to 33% in 2009, and exports fell from 60% to 39% during the same period. In past decades, President Kennedy's Alliance for Progress, President Bush Sr.'s Initiative for the Americas, and President Clinton's call for a summit of the Americas were all visionary and strategic proposals designed to enhance trade and cooperation in the region. None of those exist today. Hence, there is a growing perception that the US lacks a strategic, a strategic vision towards the region. In order to reverse that, the US will need a renewed set of policies to address the remaining priorities of its Latin American and Caribbean agenda, which includes issues of security, crime violence, repatriation of criminals, illegal drug trafficking, illegal weapons trade, human rights protection, labor rights, climate change, remittances, and migration. Yet the question, does Latin America and the Caribbean really matter, still looms out there. And in response, we have to say that the region is a place of enormous contrasts. It is not wealthy enough to become a state-of-the-art center for international financial transactions. It is not poor enough to provoke worldwide pity. It is not dangerous enough to generate global fear. So what is the importance of Latin America and where does its major contribution lie? For a long time, it has been considered that it is in the realm of culture where Latin America and the Caribbean have made their mark and built their brand and reputation on a global scale. It has been through literature, music, dance, film, painting, and the arts in general, where Latin American soul has been discovered. Who has not been touched by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Cien Años de Soledad, 100 Years of Solitude? Mario Vargas Llosa's La Fiesta del Chivo, about the Dominican Republic's dictatorship Trujillo, the Feast of the Goat, or the poems by the Chilean Nobel Prize winner, Pablo Neruda, 
20 poemas de amor y una canción desesperada. What about admiring the widely recognized artistic movements like muralism, muralismo, which began in Mexico, represented by such outstanding figures as Diego Rivera, David Alfaro Siqueiros, and Jose Clemente Orozco, or the paintings of Frida Kahlo, one of the most distinguished Latin American artists of all times, who had a style that combined realism, symbolism, and surrealism. Who has not jumped from his or her seat at the sound of merengue, salsa, bachata, vallenato, or reggaeton? Who has not laughed over the years with Cantinflas movies or sensed the emotions of Colombian soap operas like Betty La Fea, Ugly Betty? In addition to this notorious cultural presence in the world, for the last three decades, given the enormous demographic, economic, social, and political transformations that have been taking place in the region, Latin America and the Caribbean has emerged as a key player in global affairs, one that needs to be watched closely. Due to the implementation of sound social policies, life expectancy has increased from 71 years of age in 2000 to 74 years of age now in 2012. Child mortality has decreased significantly in the last 10 years. Unemployment has dropped from 9% in 2005 to 6.4% in 2012. Poverty and extreme poverty have fallen as well from 48% in 1990 to 28.8% in 2012. All this has resulted in an increase of the Human Development Index and the expansion of a new, more sophisticated, global-oriented middle class in the different countries in the region. Through great efforts and innovative programs, illiteracy has been seriously addressed for the first time in the region's history. Access to education has broadened, making it available to almost everyone, regardless of distance and social conditions. Teacher training programs and salary increases have been materialized. New technologies have been introduced at all academic levels, rising the efficiency, content, and quality of education, even though there is still much to be done in that field. In terms of infrastructure development, the changes in nearly every country in Latin America and the Caribbean have been astounding and breathtaking. The skylines in major cities have been replaced with new buildings constructed with steel and glass, thus resembling the modern view of developed countries. That can be fully appreciated in cities like Sao Paulo, Mexico City, Panama City, Bogota, Santiago de Chile, Buenos Aires, and of course, Santo Domingo. Major improvements have been achieved in paving roads, providing fresh water, building homes for the poor and middle class, erecting schools and hospitals, constructing subway systems, and promoting access to new information and communications technologies. Internet in Latin America and the Caribbean is in continuous growth. At this moment, there are more than 255 million users, which is nearly half the region's population. As the World Bank established in a recent report, the region also leads in global mobile growth, with almost 660 million mobile telephones in use. That represents a density of 107 cellular devices for every 100 residents. That means there are more phones than people in Latin America today. Nowadays, Latin America and the Caribbean nations have become urban, modern societies. More than 81% of the population lives in cities, which was exactly the opposite 50 years ago. And many economic activities have also shifted into a more service-oriented economy. So there is an undeniable sense of progress, social change, and modernization taking place around the region. And the only question or sense of uncertainty relating to its future is about its long-term sustainability. And in order to become sustainable and competitive in the 21st century, the Latin American and Caribbean nations must be able to move forward with an agenda to improve the quality of education, promote science and technology, enhance innovation, diversify their economies, increase productivity, and integrate within the global chain of production. Moving now towards a more sensitive area, if I may, I know that due to President Hugo Chavez's recent passing, 
an upcoming presidential election scheduled for next Sunday in Venezuela, there is some concern, especially here in the US, about the strength and viability of democracy in the region and about the political meaning and role of what has been identified as the new, Amer as the new Latin American left. One must remember that from some 200 years ago, since achieving their independence, the Latin American and Caribbean nations always aspired to install democracy within their respective societies. But for different historical reasons, with only very few exceptions, these aspirations were not fulfilled during the 19th or the first half of the 20th century. And it was only after the end of the Second World War that a swing of the pendulum in favor of democracy began to take place in countries like Guatemala and Venezuela. However, soon this swing began to reverse. In Guatemala, Jacobo Arbenz nationalized United Fruit Company, an American corporation, and soon after the US government intervened toppling Arbenz on the grounds of being pro-communist. The Cold War influence in blurring the differences among US government officials between nationalistic policies and communism. The Truman Doctrine, or policy of containment, clouded the vision of various US administrations in dealing with the issue of nationalism and not making the mistake of confusing it with communism. Even Fidel Castro, in 1952, was running to become a member of the Chamber of Deputies representing the province of Havana, when Fulgencio Batista led the coup that derailed Cuba from its democratic path. During its first stage, after 1959, the Cuban Revolution was not a socialist revolution, but a nationalist one. It appeals not to Karl Marx or to Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, but more to Jose Marti, Antonio Maceo, and Maximo Gomez. But Castro had nationalized, as Arbenz did before him, American corporate interests. And as a reaction to that, the invasion of PICS, which was oriented towards overthrowing his regime, failed. It was only after that episode in, 1950, in 1961 that the Cuban Revolution aligned itself with the Soviet Union, thus becoming a major player in the Cold War drama. My own country, the Dominican Republic, is a clear historical example of confusion created among US policymakers between nationalism and communism when President Johnson ordered a military occupation of the small island nation to prevent it from becoming a second Cuba. What really was at stake in the Dominican Republic in 1965 had nothing to do with a country becoming a second Cuba. It was about the return to democracy and constitutional order and the reposition of Juan Bosch to the presidency who had been overthrown by a military coup d'etat in 1963 after winning in a, in a landslide the first democratic elections that took place in the country after the fall of the Trujillo dictatorship. But exactly the opposite occurred in neighboring Haiti, where President Clinton, authorized by UN uh, Council resolution, ordered the deployment of US troops to remove the military regime installed in 1991 by a coup d'etat and restore the elected president, Jean Bertrand Aristide, back into office to end his term. What made the difference in terms of decision making in these similar cases between the Dominican Republic and Haiti was one main and single factor, the Cold War, which divided the world in two different lines of thought and political behavior. With the end of that historical period, the Red Scare disappeared and with it the fear that a communist takeover might deviate any democratic political process. It has been only during the last three decades that democracy has been fully established in Latin America and the Caribbean. According to recent polls taken by a highly recognized firm, Latino Barometro, at this moment there is a high appreciation in the region of what democracy has brought to different nations in terms of respect for human rights, free and fair elections, freedom of the press, independence of the judiciary, the respect for the rule of law, and government accountability. With the flourishing of democracy in the region, organizations that were originally involved in armed revolutionary struggle have put down their arms and integrated themselves within the democratic process 
to participate through the electoral system as a way of having access to power. This is the case, just to mention three examples, of the Frente Farabundo Martí de Liberación Nacional in El Salvador, Frente Sandinista de Liberación Nacional in Nicaragua, Frente Amplio in Uruguay, all of which, after many years of political arms confrontation, have won national elections in a fairly manner and now rule their countries through democratic means. During the Cold War, the left-wing movement in Latin America or any other part of the world was engaged in a process of bringing down capitalism as a system. This is not the case in Latin America today. No elected government in the region is even remotely considering overturning the capitalist system. Nowadays, left-wing politics in Latin America is more concerned with challenging what is called the orthodox free market philosophy, identified as the Washington Consensus and the flaws and disparities emerging from globalization. The Washington Consensus was essentially a response to the macroeconomic crisis that affected Latin America and the Caribbean in the 80s. It focused mainly on market stabilization, trade and privatization, and ignored the social issues of poverty, unemployment, and social inequality. This lack of human or social element, labeled as a market-centered neoliberal approach, generated the conditions for its rejection in different parts of the region, creating the breeding ground for the return of state-centric policies in Latin America. With different characteristics, national conditions, international styles, and personal leadership styles, it is this view of economic and social development centered on the state instead of the market, which has been considered as a swing to the left in Latin America and the Caribbean. Other elements that have also contributed to these images of Latin America leaning towards the left have been the fact that some elected heads of state come from the indigenous movement, the labor unions, the progressive military or feminist groups, such as Evo Morales, Luis Ignacio da Silva Lula, Dilma Rousseff, and Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. Therefore, at this pivotal moment, more than the left as a dominant force, it is fair to indicate that two opposing economic, political, and social views pervade Latin America and the Caribbean, neoliberalism and neopopulism. The future of democracy in the region will depend upon our ability to overcome these two distinct and contrasting paradigms. Instead of being too much focused on the left or the right, what the region needs is a new set of policies that can balance the role of state with that of the market. What is also needed at this moment in Latin America and the Caribbean is the capacity to integrate market forces with social policies upheld by a culture of solidarity, cooperation, and partnership for development. At the beginning of this second decade of the 21st century, what Latin America needs is more and better democracy, more sustainable economic growth, preservation of the environment and natural resources, more jobs, better quality education and healthcare, and widespread prosperity and opportunity for all. If you allow me, I would like to conclude by briefly referring to the Latino community in the US. And as indicated by the Census Bureau, as of 2012, there are 52 million Latinos living in this great nation, making it the largest ethnic or race minority at this moment. They constitute 16.7% 16, 16 of the US total population, and the projections are that by 2050, will account for 132 million inhabitants, representing 30% of US total population. Latinos will continue entering the workforce in growing numbers. In 2011, it reached 15% of the total US labor force, and by 2050, it is expected to be at the level of 24%. In the last 15 years, there has been a 53% increase of the total number of Latinos serving in elected office, which demonstrate their growing political influence at the government level. Many Latinos have distinguished themselves in the arts, academia, business, politics, and diverse professional activities. Names such as Jennifer Lopez, better known as J-Lo, 
Mark Anthony, Carlos Santana, Gloria Stefan, Salma Hayek, Zoe Saldana, A-Rod. His real name is Alex Rodriguez, but he changed it for A-Rod. And Juno Diaz, just to name a few, are very familiar and quite popular around the nation, which makes us, us, makes us all Latin Americans very proud of them. The Latino community represents a great force in the US, as can be proven with the fact that they have a purchasing power of $1.5 trillion a year within the US market. But also through the results of the last presidential elections in which it became decisive in the outcome. Latinos made their mark on election day as they voted for President Bar Barack Obama's reelection over Republican candidate Mitt Romney, 71% to 27%. And they were instrumental in helping President Obama win in two of the key battleground states, Nevada, 70 to 25%, and Colorado, 75 to 23%. In Spanish, we say, Obama le dio una pela. Hmm? <laughs> Taking into account the electoral results, Republican strategy and CNN contributor Ana Navarro, who was the national Latino co-chair of McCain's presidential campaign, stated, quote, if we don't do better with Hispanics, we'll be out of the White House forever. Noting the importance of Latinos, President Obama said, quote, our country was built on and continues to thrive on its diversity, and there is no doubt that the future of the United States is inextricably linked to the future of the Hispanic community. Beyond question, Latin America's influence has expanded at such length around the globe that it has recently reached the unreachable dream, a Latin American Pope, El Papa Francisco, <laughs> sitting on the chair of St. Peter in the heart of the Vatican. Thank you very much.